Pérez, no sencillo, so we do it we first recall our previous discussion, so we uh, derived equations which describe intensity distribution uh, within the constructive <coughs> and destructive ranges of interference pattern. So we figure out that indeed the maximum intensity and minimum intensity, which actually equals to zero, is at the center of this respective fringes, and there is some dependence, uh, decrease of intensity as we go moving from uh, center of constructive interference fringe and also increase of intensity as we go from the center of uh, destructive interference fringe. <clears throat> so uh, there was also uh, another opportunity, considered another opportunity to create uh, two coherent light sources and we consider reflection, so from some mirror surface. And when we deal with either uh, imaginary uh, second light source, all equations which were derived for two slits interference, uh, they are applicable for such case. However, we need to take into account that once there is a reflection from optically more dense medium so when we have a um, reflection from medium with higher refractive index uh, we need to take into account a uh, uh, phase shift of 180 degrees <coughs> so this fact results in uh, modification of the final equations for constructive and destructive interference conditions um, to be more specific kind of flipping them. So uh, previously destructive interference uh, condition for two regular two slits um, interference now becomes condition for constructive interference and vice versa. So that happens because of this uh, phase shift by 180 degrees. Today we continue discussion of interference under different conditions, in particular interference in thin films. <laughs> I think you notice that if there is some uh, gas still on uh, water surface, um, in reflected light we see some kind of colorful patterns. So this is the result of um, interference in a thin film because this uh, gasoline forms a thin transparent layer on top of water due to uh, lower density of this fuel uh, than water, so it stays on top, forms very thin layer, and uh, we deal with a uh, thin film on top of water surface um, with different optical constants, with different refractive index in comparison to water. As a result, we get some um, reflection from the surface of the film on top of the water and some reflection from the interface um, between the film and the water. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, two rays going to the observer. They interact with each other, superimpose, and also we can observe interference effects means constructive and destructive interference. So let us go into this phenomenon. <clears throat> so let us consider a thin film. On some substrate. So this is our substrate here. <clears throat> so the thickness of the thin film is T. Then we have incident ray. Then we have a reflected ray. And also we need to specify that here we have 
n equal to unity, so it's air. Then we have uh, n film, and here is n substrate. Or it can be air, so it doesn't matter if there is some very thin film uh, freestanding that also will be a valid model. <clears throat> So obviously we have one refracted ray, which goes into the material of the thin film. And then we have reflection from the back uh, surface or from the interface between film and substrate. Then there is refraction back into the air. And this comes to the those re reflected ray. Let's call it ray number one. And uh, ray number two, they are traveling to the observer. <clears throat> so now, um, if the first medium from where the incident ray is moving. Do you have a question? No. No? Okay. So if we have uh, first air, uh, medium uh, air, so refractive index is equal to unity, uh, obviously the refractive index of the film will be higher than unity. So in this case, we have this uh, situation when we have reflection from the medium with higher refractive index means that here for ray number one, reflected ray number one, we will get uh, delta phi phase shift equal to 180 degrees. <clears throat> um, now let us think about ray number two. Will we have any phase shift there or not? What do you think? changes when it reflects but there is a condition so it should reflect from the medium with higher refractive index if it reflects from the medium with lower refractive index nothing happens phase shift doesn't change it parts and it reflects because the same the medium is higher reflecting index should exchange. So it depends on the uh, refractive index of the substrate and uh, film. So if NS is larger than N film, then yes, there will be here we have reflect reflection from this interface and phase shift will be changed. However, if <coughs> NS is smaller, then NF, uh, then uh, refractive index of the material of the film, then there is no phase shift due to this reflection because refractive index of the medium from which the reflection is happening is small. Uh, for instance, if this is air, if N is equal to unity, so we have freestanding film, then obviously it will be smaller. Uh, and we don't have any phase shift. So let us consider that n is equal to unity or uh, is smaller than the refractive index of the uh, field. <clears throat> so in this case, delta V will be equal to zero. There is no phase shift. <clears throat> so now, taking this into account, we also need to uh, re recall from our previous discussions that the wavelengths of this monochromatic light uh, which we are dealing with will be inside the film different from that in air so it will be lambda divided by n uh, n of the field so we remember that speed of light drops when it travels in some material. Since we have conservation of energy, frequency remains constant, but wavelength is changing. And what we need to consider 
Uh, additionally, is the uh, difference in uh, optical paths between ray one and ray two. So if we consider these angles, uh, like incident angle alpha small, then we can write that the difference in optical passes between ray one and ray two will be equal to two thicknesses of the film. So it just goes down and up. And that is the difference uh, which ray uh, two travels longer in comparison to ray one. <clears throat> so now taking into account this difference in passes and uh, the fact that we have this phase shift for ray one uh, by 180 degrees, we can write that the condition for maximum of uh, like condition for constructive interference will be 2t equal m plus one half times lambda n. Uh, so means that we need to have odd number of uh, half of wavelengths in order to observe the maximum interference. So the same condition as we had for a reflectance when we create two uh, coherent uh, light sources we are reflectance. Uh, and it's opposite for classical case when we have two slits interference. Then we need to have integer number of uh, wavelengths in the uh, difference of, of uh, optical passes. <clears throat> so assuming that here is the relationship between lambda of incident light and lambda n, let's call it lambda n f, uh, then we can write that <coughs> we, in terms of the valence of incident light, it will be 2 times n f times t, which is uh, refractive index of the film uh, times thickness of the film will be equal to m plus one half lambda. So th this is the condition for um, constructive interference and obviously uh, destructive uh, interference condition will be two times n f times t equal to m times lambda, where for these conditions, m is equal to zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, and so on. So this is the general theory of interference effects in case of thin films. And yesterday there was a question about some practical application of interference. So, one of the most common practical application, which we deal with quite everyday life, these are anti-reflecting coatings. So we have them from uh, very simple instruments like glasses, uh, just to reduce the reflectance from the surface of lenses. And also it is applied to way more complicated systems when we have <coughs> optical like, objectives for infrared cameras, uh, also video cameras, uh, telescopes, uh, and stuff like that. So we always, or some optical instruments like binoculars, um, uh, we always want to reduce the reflection from this optical system to get more light into the, this uh, optical instruments and more light as a result will reach the uh, photo sensor. So we will get high performance of our optical system. Um, also similar uh, anti-reflecting coatings sometimes are used on solar cells in order to reduce reflectance and increase number of photons which actually reach the uh, photoactive uh, layer to produce more photo current and thus increase performance of such devices. So uh, how does it work? So what we need to know that the 
the, the easiest option when we have a single layer anti reflection coating. And in this case, we can fine tune the thickness of the thin film, which we deposited on a uh, glass surface. But like, usually, lenses are made from glass. <laughs> Uh, in that case, we can fine tune the thickness in order to um, reduce reflectance, means create um, destructive interference condition for a specific wavelength. So, uh, if we choose some specific wavelengths from visible spectrum from light, uh, sunlight. Then usually it's uh, uh, 550 nanometers because that is the uh, intensity of uh, solar spectrum in uh, visible range. And also uh, it is uh, coincides with the highest sensitivity of human eye uh, to these particular wavelengths. So we kind of gain from both sides. If we increase specifically this part of the, the spectrum, uh, this specific gradients are uh, going through the optical system without unnecessary reflection. Uh, so we will consider some case for such um, anti-reflection uh, coating. Uh, but uh, if uh, we want to create a broad anti-reflection uh, broad spectrum anti reflection coating. So that's the case when we deal with a multi layer anti reflection coating. So we have a stack of many thin films with different thicknesses and optical constants like refractive index. And um, obviously, in that case, it becomes way more complicated for calculations, but it's possible to reduce significantly reflection of the lens. Uh, in a broad spectrum, which covers pretty much all visible spectral range. <coughs> so these are quite expensive um, under reflection coatings, and they are applied for very advanced optical systems. Uh, obviously, these uh, layers, which are used for under reflecting coatings, they should possess different refractive indexes, as I mentioned before, but uh, they should be transparent. So this should be some wide band gap uh, materials which are transferred in the visible spectral range if you are talking about optical systems. Because in optical systems, we care about visible spectral range, which uh, varies from uh, 380 and maybe 780 nanometers. <clears throat> so, let us consider anti-reflecting coating with one layer. So this is our system. It will be silicon, silicon dioxide. That is kind of more applicable for photovoltaic applications. So we have silicon substrate with refractive index 3.5. Then we have silicon dioxide, refractive index 1.45. And we have air with n equal to unity. Let's make it a bit longer here. So we have again incident. Um, light, then reflection, then we have refracted ray, reflected ray, and again refraction. So this is ray number one, this is ray number two. So now tell me please, what will be phase shift with rays one and rays two? Uh, with respect to incident uh, light because of reflection. So for first ray, 180 degrees, and for second one, we 
Why? What? The index of the if uh, the current index of this becomes higher. Yes, it will change. So we will have also here one hundred eight because we have one reflection. Uh, it's in the in the interface silicon dioxide silicon. So in this case, it will change. So uh, now we will the conditions for constructive and destructive interference will actually be the same as uh, conditions for normal regular double slit interference. So that's why. So what we we, we want to do here. Um, this is our thickness, T. Uh, we want to create conditions for destructive interference. We want to uh, reduce uh, reflected light intensity because of destructive interference. And uh, since we deal with given materials, so silicon, silicon dioxide, their refractive indexes are properties of their uh, material so obviously these numbers are given for some specific wavelengths which is 550 nanometers because this is the wavelength we are interested in we want to reduce its reflection and <clears throat> condition for destructive interference will be two times n uh, silicon dioxide here we will write just n, but we know that this is the refractive index of the film um, times thickness of the film equal to lambda over two. So we get uh, destructive interference. So we have odd number of uh, the half of wavelengths. So in this case, we want to make film as thin as possible. So we just pick up the uh, just half of the wavelengths. <clears throat> so now we can express thickness of the film. So it's lambda divided by uh, 4 times n. And if we substitute here our numbers, so it will be wavelengths is 550 nanometers divided by 4 times 1.45. And that will be about 94.8 nanometers so let's say about 95 nanometers of silicon dioxide so this is the thickness of the silicon dioxide film which should be deposited on top of silicon in order to uh, get minimum reflection actually we Calculate this for uh, uh, destructive interference means we get zero reflection from this stack um, if the wavelength of the instant light uh, is 550 nanometers. Obviously, that uh, if we the instant light is uh, white light, like sunlight, uh, all other wavelengths will will reflect. It will not satisfy this. And, uh, constructive uh, destructive interference conditions. Uh, however, specifically for these 550 nanometers, which corresponds to the highest intensity in the sunlight uh, and uh, the wavelengths towards which our perception of so so called photopic uh, perception curve also possesses the maximum uh, will be. Uh, not reflected, uh, and uh, in this case, it will just go into the silicon substrate, where it will produce some uh, photogenerated charge carriers and contribute to photocara. <clears throat> so now we kind of finished the discussion of interference and. Uh, also discuss the practical application of interference. So this is one of the options. There are other uh, cases, specifically some optical instruments for like metrology, where you need to measure very uh, small distances, uh, thickness of thin films, or also it's uh, recently applied in these famous experiments for detecting gravitational waves. 
So they use so-called uh, microsons interferometer. They have two perpendicular uh, lines with uh, mirrors, um, very high quality monochromatic illumination, and uh, the fact that space is uh, changing uh, is the net dimension uh, while the gravitational wave is passing through. Um, depends on orientation with respect to these channels of Michelson's uh, interferometer. Uh, so um, one will change, another will not change its length because they're perpendicular to each other. And uh, 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 measuring the change of the length of the uh, channels um, with interference effect, uh, you can detect very like tiny uh, changes, re relative changes of the length of these channels. Uh, we're indicating on the uh, measured signal and uh, resulting in actually detecting gravitational waves passing through the uh, structure of this uh, interferon. So in order to measure very tiny uh, changes uh, of the lens, they are designed in like huge uh, size is like something like 1.5 kilometer length of one channel in order to get measurable change of the length for such system uh, and uh, actually be capable for detecting such extremely weak signals. So uh, our next topic is diffraction and that's what we are supposed to cover um during next week the thing is that next week i will not be here attending a conference so i will be uh i, I prepared two lectures for you online they will be they will go online after today's lecture uh that will be introduction to diffraction and also some uh practical demonstrational um application of diffraction in order uh, to determine wavelengths of uh, unknown wavelengths of some monochromatic illumination. So uh, the instrument which is necessary is diffraction grating. Um, so there will be some introduction of diffraction grating. And uh, so some quanti quali uh, quantity analysis in this demonstration will be carried out in the video. Uh, but now I just wanted to show you the in demonstrational purpose. Uh, so here I have three different lasers with different wavelengths. So if we consider this is a blue laser, this is a red one, and this is a green one. So we have different wavelengths, obviously. Uh, lasers, these are instruments which produce monochromatic illumination. And so that's why they have uh, just one single wavelength. Well, depends on the quality of the lasers. So these guys are from uh, Amazon. So they are not the, uh, the best lasers you can find on this planet, but they possess quite decent monochromatic illumination. And from this video um, lecture about diffracting gratings, you will see that indeed uh, by applying specialized instrument, uh, spectrophotometer, uh, we'll, you will see that they indeed give a very sharp peak uh, at corresponding wavelengths. <clears throat> so, tell me who from you were using these discs, CD and DVD discs. Nice. Yeah, okay, you're still, still in this field. I saw that these kids already don't, <laughs> don't use anything like this. <clears throat> it was something great. Imagine when you have a transition from this floppy disk. You know what is floppy disk? Yes. So it was three point, well, at my time when I was your age, I was still using floppy disks. Um, but this smaller version is like three point like three inches because they were larger, like five inches. So those were already not used anymore, but the smaller ones, so they had 3.5 nanometers. Imagine how 
great it is to go from 3.5 megabytes to 500 megabytes. So it was a big achievement. And later, this DVD disk, that was something unbelievable. <coughs> you get gigabytes. Uh, so who knows how this guy is designed? Why it has this colorful reflection on this surface? So we have some plastic uniform uh, substrate, and then uh, there is with some laser, it's created a uh, sequence of trenches uh, on the surface. So they kind of work uh, with, with laser, and uh, there are trenches at some distance from each other. So they are quite densely packed. So we have kind of periodic uh, structure with uh, trenches closely placed to each other. Uh, so that is classical example of uh, diffracting grating because that's what we have like um, multiple uh, slits next to it. So when we consider just diffracting gratings can be operating in uh, different modes, it either transmission or reflection. So obviously these guys are more applicable in the reflection mode. So you can use it as a diffraction grating. And why I have two of them, like uh, CD and DVD, because obviously for DVD, these trenches, so the only difference is that trenches are packed much closer to each other. So we have smaller period for diffraction grating. So now if we consider some laser, maybe it will be safe to do it here. So if we have some reflection from the surface of this uh, disk uh, with monochromatic light, you see we have this, how to remind them. Okay. Here, oh. So you see the central and also, so it's zero and first order diffraction maximum. So they are a little bit curved just because the circular structure of these traces. Ideally, it would be perfect, like parallel, so it, they will be just, just points. So this is the the same diffraction grating and two different wavelengths. So we have this is the longest wavelength you have seen. Let's say I stay more or less in the same position. Do it again. So, yeah. So you kind of have a feeling what the distance is between two first order maxima. So now we keep it in the same position. We use the uh, shorter wavelength. And now we see already that first order maxima are placed much closer and they are placed so close that we can see even two second order maxima. So because of the period of the diffraction rating is uh, constant, we change the wavelength, the distance between uh, the or angular position, linear position of the diffraction maxima uh, will change because of the change wavelengths. So if we know the distance between the diffraction gradient and the screen where we observe the diffraction maxima, uh, we know the uh, period of the diffraction gradient, and that's known information in this case because it's just standard CD disk and DVD disk, they have standard distance between these uh, trenches. Uh, then by measuring angular position or linear position, the pair, um, we can determine the wavelengths of monochromatic light. So if we have some sources of monochromatic light, which we do not uh, know, they will uh, 
it will be possible to use such a uh, system in order to determine their unknown wave. So during this uh, video lecture, I determined, uh, like let's say, estimated uh, the wavelengths of these two lasers using this disk and also like DVD disk. And uh, uh, then I used uh, professional instruments with the photometer, which gives like very precise determination of the instant wavelength and compared these results. So there was not such a big difference. So you will see how it works and which equations we need to use. Uh, so it was just some uh, demonstrational purpose of showing the diffraction application because um, actually diffraction gratings are used in this like highly accurate uh, pro professional spectrophotometers in order to split instant light in different wavelengths and then by calibrating for certain wavelengths angular positions you have a calibrated device and uh, that allows you to determine the uh, wavelengths and analyze the uh, spectral composition of the instant light. Uh, so after this uh, week, which is coming, where we focus on uh, diffraction, so next week that will be a week dedicated for uh, final exam. And uh, if you have any technical questions related to the organization or some issues with your exams, so you are welcome to write me an email, but taking into account this fact that I'm leaving for a conference, this will be our last lecture for this, for this semester. Okay, thank you very much for attention and good luck with your final exams and see you around.